Hey everybody, welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning explained, we'll be looking at Await Further Instructions, a sci-fi horror scenario where a family finds their home put on lockdown after a mysterious incident, and their only contact with outside is via instructions on their television set. I like this one quite a bit, as it works as a satisfying genre film with splashes of horror throughout, and going full on in the last couple of minutes especially, that I was like, whoa, I was not expecting that. But there's a lot more to explain on this one than just the ending, as there's also a deeper subtext to the story, which reveals its overall intentions and meanings, a kind of statement on modern society and particularly about how information or news is spread. This idea is at the heart of our story, all experienced through the quibbling Milgram family, each with their own independent ideals and beliefs, which eventually, thanks to our invasion, leads to a complete collapse amongst them as they turn on each other and their deeper-seated familial issues come flooding to the surface. Even the presence or entity for lack of a better term, behind the bizarre invasion has a deeper meaning or purpose as well that becomes clear by the end. So it's less about what it is, but what it means. And we will get even deeper into what all this is about as it appears in the story. So let's dive into await further instructions, breaking down the movie, the meaning of the invasion, what the entity is, as well as explaining the ending, which is also quite surprising. The movie opens with an ominous phrase written in an old school teletext format. It's the things you love that kill you. Well, isn't that heartwarming? But this does quite aptly summarize much of the movie's ideas and kicks us off on the right foot of what to expect going forward. We follow couple Nick and Angie driving down a rural British motorway, off to visit his family for the holidays. Based on Nick's behavior, there's a palpable sense of dread of his family meeting Angie, as he hasn't been home in a few years, but even more importantly, he's worried about spoiling everyone's Christmas. So she pulls him together to go and meet the folks. But come on, they can't be that bad, right? Especially as his mother Beth is warm and excited to see them, even if she is a bit confused by the basket of Indian trees Angie has for her. She's just happy her son is home, and it's going to be a full house this Christmas. Then meeting Gramps, who is about as curmudgeonly and abrasive as humanly possible, seeming perturbed to meet Angie due to a race, as the news playing on TV gives us our first indication of what's to come, detailing rolling power surges in the Midlands and country, which is now spreading to other areas of the country as well. But it's Nick's father, Tony, who makes the biggest impression, coming downstairs, and as soon as he enters, the air seems to escape the room with his presence, who instantly gives his son shit for not knowing he was coming. And now at work, people give things in writing a month in advance. Okay, sure, let me send you a formal letter. Jeez. To be fair, he does have reason to be more bristly towards Nick, who hasn't been around his family or even answering the phone in the past three years. So there is obviously some distance between them. And it's already pretty obvious why, as his dad is a total dick. I wouldn't want to talk to that jerk either. Angie tries to deflect the sour mood, apologizing and taking the blame for having to work late on her shift as a nurse, and warmly shaking his hand to properly introduce herself. When she goes outside to phone her mother, the call dies before it goes through, implying that whatever is behind those power surges is on its way to the area. But it's the broken family dynamics that first begin to take center stage. Nick noticing on the tree the same Christmas decorations they've used for years, and admiring the lights, hopeful they can have a nice family Christmas he reminisces about as a child. After leaving, Gramps insults Nick as being a pansy, suggesting to slap some scent into the boy, adding that Tony is a loser too as he is a lowly office drone. But Tony defensively corrects him in his position as office manager. That's right, manager pops. Don't you forget it, bud. Here beginning to uncover why Tony is the way he is. Because of his father constantly cutting him down his whole life as not being strong enough and continuing to do so even as he's a full grown man with his own family. This eventually proving to be his undoing. They're soon joined by Nick's a boisterous pregnant sister Kate and her baby daddy Scotty. Kate is all smiles and hugs until getting to her brother. They're interactions seeming to indicate issues there too. Jeez, everyone's got issues in this family, which only gets worse as they too seem to have prejudiced opinions based on Angie's race. When mentioning she's giving birth soon, Kate references the idea of undercover Muslim doctors, making things nice and awkward for everyone. Yeah, that definitely sounds like the truth. Where'd you read that shit, Kate? On Facebook or something? And it's not much better when trying to play a friendly game of Scrabble. Angie using the word tumult, but Kate gets annoyed, saying she can't use made up or Indian words. 
words, which it's a very real English word, proving that she doesn't quite know what the hell she's talking about, but is still very steadfast in her beliefs. Good combo. Starting to pick up on those statements about modern society a little bit yet? I thought you might. And we learn Kate isn't alone in her prejudices, watching a newscast about a stabbing incident. The police considering that they could be a suspected terrorist, but as in only a presumption, no actual facts or evidence to back this up. But the family, in particular Gramps, latches right onto this idea, claiming that it's no surprise that it's a terrorist again and assuring him he knows what's going on as he reads. Uh-huh, sure, Grandpa, whatever you say. Why don't you just sit in your little chair and cram it? Angie, though, does stand her ground, calling his accusations unfair, causing Kate to get defensive as he doubles down on his beliefs that ever since all the Indians have moved over to England, the country he loves has been destroyed. Now, I can't really personally speak to this as I don't live in England, but I do understand that this is a feeling that some people genuinely do have there, which admittedly is kind of hard to take seriously. But immigration is a concern to many people all over the world, so I guess Gramps ain't alone in his feelings. But Nick and Angie are horrifically offended by the family's behavior, especially as Tony expects them to apologize for the escalating situation, both deciding that it was a mistake to come here and wanting to leave. So they decide to sneak out early the next morning, but they won't be going anywhere. Hearing a distant rattling coming from the chimney, lights buzz erratically in the kitchen. Uh-oh, it's those rolling power surges we heard about earlier, but they have a lot more impact than merely blinking lights. When trying to leave, Nick opens the door to a strange sight, lines and lines of interwoven black material covering the entirety of the door opening, which he determines to be metal, with a slight crack or slot of sorts in the middle. Going through the house and discovering that all the windows as well as every other way out has been completely blocked by the same substance. So he tries, as he would, to bust his way out, as well as chopping at it with an ax, nothing having an effect or even slightly cracking the surface. Screaming out hello into the small crack wakes his father up, wondering what's all the dadgum racket, and Nick fills him in on what he knows so far, the strangeness of it almost penetrating Tony's stone cold demeanor, but after observing the material, determines it to just be nonsense. Okay, if you say so. The whole family up now each considers what could be going on, but it's Tony who takes over with his own theory that there's been some kind of incident outside and the government has quarantined their home to protect them, agreeing with what Nick said about them being metal shutters. And the strange pipe openings in each room are for pumping oxygen. Asking to check the TV, what is there appears to support his theory. A simple teletext message on the screen, await further instructions. And Tony is like, yeah, see I told you it's an emergency broadcast and everything is totally under control. Though when the others leave to check the internet, we briefly see through his tough facade and he looks a little more worried than he's letting on, deciding to enlist the simple Scotty to his ranks, appealing to them both as being real men, willing to do things that most won't to protect the family. Sure says a lot that he picks Scotty over his own son, but it's already clear they don't see eye to eye on much at all. Naturally, there is no internet signal, but dad takes dominance again, and all that they can do is wait for rescue. But in the meantime, he insists on celebrating the holiday as usual, maintaining the importance of upholding their traditional British values. If they live in fear, then the terrorists have already won. Everyone follows his orders, sitting down to a lovely turkey dinner with all the fixins. Tony giving grace before the meal. As he finishes, Angie coughs, and everyone pounces on it, thinking she might be infected with something, even though Nick asserts that it's just a cold and that she already had it before coming. She's had enough, calling this whole thing a farce, that while the world could be ending outside, they're eating Christmas dinner. Things getting even more out of hand, as Dad dutifully sets out to carve the turkey. Ah, nothing like having the family together for the holidays. Their fracas is interrupted by a new message on the TV. Your food is contaminated. Don't eat anything. So of course, Tony, blindly believing the message to be benevolent, immediately bends the entire dinner and every other piece of food in the house. Nick tries to stop him from his rash decision, but is cornered by Scotty, saying that people can survive without food for weeks, and they do at least have some bottled water. So you're right, Scotty, maybe things aren't so bad after all. Putting Gramps back into his armchair, Tony tries to assert his authority, warning him to never undermine him in front of his family, and that he's the head honcho around these parts nowadays. Gramps encourages him to act decisively and with authority, pointing out Nick as a potential issue, as he has an issue with a 
authority, blaming this on Tony for his lack of parenting skills, asking if his own style of parenting ever did any harm to him, and calling him a squelcher. British slang I had to actually look up, meaning that he doesn't live up to his promises, clearly thinking he's not capable of running his family with the same authority he raised Tony with, which is obviously what twisted him into the man he is now, so that's really not a good thing, as his greatest fear is to be what his father always has been accusing him of. New instructions come in. Strip and scrub all flesh with household bleach. Tony immediately telling Beth to grab the cleaning supplies. Scrubbing each other down with bleach. Now it's a party. Ooh, thank you for that. Old man scrubbing his balls. Definitely needed that. Thank, thank you so much, moving. Sometime later, the kids are interrupted in their sleep and asked downstairs by Beth. Surprisingly, Tony admits to being too hard on people sometimes due to the high standards he sets for himself, which is hilarious and sad all at the same time. And Nick apologizes, but Tony clarifies that he wasn't steadfast that everything he's done so far has been to protect the family, which is about to be tested on a whole new level as something drops down their chimney, a plastic bag filled with syringes, exactly enough for each member of the family a new message instructing them to use the trial vaccination kits as the atmosphere outside is polluted. Angie, ever the unrespected voice of reason and a trained nurse, by the way, is especially uncertain of following these instructions as the bag is unsealed and the needles have already been used, which is extremely dangerous. And showing how blind he is to be right and how little he respects her, Tony immediately takes a syringe and injects himself just to prove his point. The instructions were given, it must be done. They do at least sterilize the rest of the needles in boiling water and go through the family one by one. Kate initially hesitant due to the possible effects on her unborn child, but ultimately gives in to her father's ways, leaving only Nick and Angie, who also decide it's best to just do it to maintain order with the others. And of course, the potential is there that his father and the instructions are ultimately trying to help them, as Tony triumphantly declares, we're safe now, until Grant starts convulsing violently in his chair, proceeding to vomit out liters of black liquid before collapsing on the floor and his movement ceasing. The screen now reading, vaccination complete, which inadvertently tells us something quite important. Whoever or whatever is sending these instructions must be watching them. How else would they know that they had taken all the shots, unless they are in fact being watched? But the family doesn't take notice of this, much more concerned with Grant's painful fate and wondering if the same will happen to them. Even Tony wavers for a moment, but considers that perhaps the same thing could have happened if they didn't take it, as in Grant's only died because the medication didn't work, showing just how easy it is to create lines of thought to fit our own preferred reality. And he's obviously losing touch with it, not even really mourning his father who just vomited up black goo all over the place and croaked, calling him only an acceptable casualty. Cool, cool, cool. That's a man with coal running through his veins. They are then asked to return the used syringes through that weird slot in the front door, gathering them up and Scotty pushing them through, the material appearing to actually be breathing in a sense as if it were alive. And Scotty seizes an opportunity to call for help through the slot, the message changing to slot contaminated and quickly seals closed, taking some of Scotty's fingers off in the process. That'll teach you, bud. Upstairs, Tony and Nick gather with Graham's body to say goodbye, getting a lot more insight into the impetus of what made Tony into the person he is now, recalling a childhood story where he wet the bed. He was so frightened of waking his father with the flush of the toilet that he merely stayed in bed all night and had an accident. His dad could hear him crying all night, but just left him there, and in the morning pummeled him for doing so. Oh, wow, Graham's is way more brutal than I initially suspected. And we can see just how this one incident of most likely many, many more would be enough to completely warp a kid's thinking. And that kind of upbringing turned him into the rigid control freak that he is that can't ever be proven wrong. But he gives himself some relief of believing that there is a higher purpose for himself and that everything happens for a reason, even this. Nick tries to cut in, but he argues he doesn't understand his position as he's not a father and can't comprehend how he feels and the importance of wanting to protect one's family, even though he's going about it in all the wrong ways. So, you know, good for him, I guess. As long as he's convinced he's right, that's all that really matters to Tony anyway. A brief reprieve of rest is interrupted by new orders. One of you is infected. Isolate them. And guess who they all immediately point their fingers to? Because of her having a cold or whatever, but it seems more like a convenient excuse due to their prejudice more than anything else. And when put to a vote, it's unanimous. Minus mom who runs off, but also still allowing it to happen, doing his best to stop them. Nick attacks them with a lamp, but gets overpowered by Scotty and his dad, choking him on the couch. Only stop 
shocked when Beth returns, belting out a Christmas song through tears. Uh oh, this whole thing is causing her to lose her shit too. But her actions are at least absurd enough to stop the fighting for the moment and protect her son from any more violence. Well, things certainly took a turn towards the primal there. I mean, he was trying to choke out his own kid. And all of this because it's what the TV told them to be the truth. So Angie is tossed in the room along with Grandpa's corpse and ever the perceptive one. She's the first to pick up on the fact that the messages are responding to their actions, considering the timing and how each set of instructions caused things to get worse between the family, as though they are being watched through the TV, and encourages Nick to try to turn it off to see what happens. He's a little hesitant, worried over what his father would do, but she tells him he has to at least try and be willing to stand up to him, which didn't turn out so hot last time thanks to dad's little helper Scotty, but sure, why not? Let's see what happens. It does appear to turn off without incident, but his sister catches him in the act, trying to explain what he's doing, but she gets emotional, seeing where their familial beef lies, thinking that he always thinks he's better than the rest of them. No offense, Kate, but you're an obnoxious, gobsmacking know-it-all who knows absolutely nothing. So it's not about being better, but just acknowledging you might be wrong on occasion. It's not that difficult, right? She tattles to her daddy about Nick breaking the TV, and he starts to freak out too when seeing his precious instructions gone. But it does eventually kick back to life, displaying an array of different symbols before briefly flashing what looks like a countdown, which usually isn't a good thing. They're then floored by a new message coming in, warning them that interrupting emergency signals puts lives at risk, causing Kate to freak out and lash out at her brother, then getting tackled by Scotty, the two fighting up the stairs, being egged on by Kate to fight for her and be a man and callously screaming out to get him, referring to Nick like he's not even her brother, but an actual threat at this point. Boy, they have really turned on him on a dime. But it's Kate that bears the brunt of the consequences here. During the fight, accidentally getting knocked over the railing by Scotty, landing with a thud to the floor, and Scotty stares down blankly, backing away from things, glancing to the TV, briefly seeing a message. I see you appearing in a state of absolute shock after what just happened, as well as confirming with complete certainty that they are being monitored by whatever is administering the instructions. In a frenzied state, they bring a pained Kate onto the kitchen table, Nick trying to get Scotty back together, until Kate passes out from shock. But even more shocking is that amongst all the chaos, Tony, ever the fearless leader, decides to excuse himself, as it's too noisy down here and he needs to work on a new plan, getting chided by Nick about his daughter possibly dying as he leaves. Okay, Thanks a lot, Dad. Catch you. Catch you later, I guess. Oh. Things are looking more desperate than ever, and a beleaguered Beth attempts to reach out to whoever is controlling their situation, asking the TV for help but getting no response. And when Nick describes his sister's wounds to Angie, she knows that it's most likely infected, and she will soon die if not given proper medical attention. When telling his mom, it's clear that she can't accept what's happening anymore, and also becomes disconnected just like her husband, saying that there's more family coming tomorrow and she needs to get to work on cleaning the house. Okay, mom's lost the plot too. Trying to console Scotty, he opens up about the names that he and Kate had chosen for their unborn child. Ruby if a girl, and Samuel if a boy. Nick tries to get him on board with his side to get Kate help, but he's still swirling with Tony's rhetoric, saying they have to follow their leader. Nick correctly pointing out that their so-called leader has locked himself up, and so they obviously cannot depend on him, seeing in his office what his big plan is, cooking up something based on military tactics for a siege scenario, making drawings of movements on a blueprint of the house, and already planning on who to not give out their rations of water to. Guess who's first on the list? No surprise there. Nick tries a different tactic, still hoping for a way to get past the black material surrounding the house, removing the water pipe attached to the toilet, bashing a hole big enough to peek inside, but seeing only darkness. He then rigs up his phone to a broomstick, pushing it into the walls. As downstairs, they are greeted by an alarm. Exfiltration in progress, meaning it's not happy with Nick, who brings the phone back, seeing it's now covered in a slimy black goo, and when checking the footage from the phone, sees what caused it. Right outside the house, several long black strands resembling tentacles launch at the phone. His dad enters in a furious state, and when Nick pleads to look at the footage, he likes to beat the crap out of him and stick him in another room instead. He's through listening to his son, saying he's caused enough trouble already, as Scotty returns with news of new instructions. Extract information from sleeper agent, and without question or hesitation, Tony puts together a makeshift torture kit from his toolbox to torture his son for supposed information. It's really getting out of hand now. 
He begs his dad to stop listening to the TV, but as this would prove him incorrect, he will never even consider this possibility, commanding him to start at the beginning and tell him how long he's been planning this. Screaming that he's his son, Tony isn't interested, taking the razor and slicing his own child's face. Scott finally steps in to stop him, as Nick asks him to just look at the phone footage, but he says he doesn't trust him anymore, dropping the phone and smashing it, and even blaming Nick for everything, saying that conveniently all this started since he showed up. Trying his best to reach through to his dad, he points out what has really been going on, that they're obviously see subjects in a twisted experiment, and they have in fact done all of this to themselves. Well, that's true, that's definitely what's going on, as all of the violence against each other consistently stem from the instructions. But dad mocks him, as always being too clever for his own good, taking a screwdriver going for his eye. Fortunately, or not really, stopped by Beth shouting for them from downstairs, as Kate has passed from her injuries. Tony is nonplussed as usual by his family's dropping numbers, muttering that this changes nothing, and in war, there are casualties, which is finally enough for Beth, slapping him, dubbing him an arrogant fool for never listening to anyone but himself, and admitting that she hates him. And at this moment, Reason temporarily takes over the madness, at least to the extent of letting Nick out of the room and not following through with their torture. Though Angie is still locked in her own room, she discovers what it is that the black surface is comprised of, able to remove a piece from the window, the strand appearing to be a video cable, staring down into it seeing a camera looking back at her. Assumedly, the entire surface here, including around the house, is actually composed of these cables, bound together into a bigger, more solidified shape, finding another old TV in the closet, which when opening the back finds several more of the cables tangled into a mass, including what looks to be a beating heart. So it is technically a lie. Opening the TV leads to a security breach, the house going into quarantine mode, billowing in black smoke into each upstairs room one by one, starting with Angie's. Instructed to return to the ground floor, seeing skulls and crossbones appear on the rooms, Nick rushes to release Angie, but it's locked, and stepping up, Scotty retrieves the backup keys, allowing them to get her out in time before the smoke completely fills the room. Unfortunately, his mother is also trapped upstairs, the door somehow stuck in the bathroom, screaming as the smoke touches her skin, causing it to char and turn black. Nick tries to smash the glass, but knowing they only have moments before the entire floor is filled with the smoke, she tells her son to go, as his mother appears to explode on the other side of the door. Well, that smoke looks to be some bad business for sure. The rest shack up in the living room, trying to fill up the edges to not let the smoke get through. Yet, just as it reaches the bottom of the stairs, it stops and retreats back up. After this, things take on a quite different change or evolution in what's transpiring, as we finally understand what this entity is really up to, turning more religious or perhaps godlike in nature. Nick attempts to smash the TV with a log, and the entire house begins to rumble violently. When it ceases, a new message emerges. I am reborn. I bring salvation, resurrection, which speaks to a still defeated Tony, finding that perhaps this was a religious judgment scenario, at least considering for the first time that he perhaps was wrong about the whole emergency broadcast thing he's been believing. What if that was in fact a test from God to prove just how devoted they really are? They're distracted by a shocking movement, the child in Kate's stomach still alive, Angie trying to rally everyone together to perform a C-section to save the baby. Now Tony is straight up worshiping at the altar of the telly, the glow growing stronger, and we're suddenly outside on a nice idyllic day, Nick waking up in a vast field. This seems to be an attempt to show the peace and tranquility the entity can provide if they choose to follow, and reality is looking especially crummy at the moment, as they find Tony and Scott grabbing Nick and about to kill Angie, the screen demanding for a sacrifice to save the newborn. Nick manages to get the knife away from his dad, as the two go man to man. Scotty tells Angie to get to work on the operation, but she demands he stop Tony first. He does try to do so, stepping between the father and son, getting an ax in the shoulder. Rather than being like, whoops, sorry dude, my mistake, Tony clearly passed the point of sanity in any conceivable form, continues hacking Scotty to pieces on the ground in cold blood. So much for that shepherd thing. They manage to disarm him, Nick and Tony choking each other, Tony berating his son for never doing what he's told, as Angie gets him from behind, and Nick, in a nice bit of irony, smashes the TV that his father loves so dearly right onto his head and killing him. Even if his dad is dead, the TV isn't about to give up, beginning to rattle and picking itself back up. Sparks shoot out along with cables that writhe and whip at them, seeing what looks like a beating heart inside of the TV. The cables then entangle together into limb-like appendages, reaching out as the walls begin to flex, also at breathing, followed by more cable appendages crashing through the window, as the two fuse together in a sea of sparks, then turns to dear old dead dad's body on the floor, going through the back of his head, unfurling out of his face on the other side, lifting his body into the air as more cables hand him the axe. It has literally turned Tony into its puppet, which he has 
has already been acting like up to this point by blindly following everything it told him to do, no matter what it was or the cost. Blocking themselves off in another room, the ceiling and walls start to crack as more cables emerge, ripping through the doors before suddenly stopping. And dad pops in to have a word, calling out to his son. Worship me, he croaks, now, or face your extinction. Every inch of the room now completely covered in cables. Nick is fed up, opening the doors and telling him to do it already, but it only backs up and doesn't strike him, again asking to join with it and become one with it. This causes Nick to come to a realization about what the entity is, a parasite. It can't kill them because it needs them. As we have seen up to this point, everything was done by people following its orders, and it seems to need to have followers to actually survive and grow. Nick attempts to destroy it right at its heart, black blood spitting out, exploding in sparks, then imploding in on itself. Thinking it's over, Angie and Nick embrace, proven wrong as their luck runs out. The tendrils getting Angie's foot, then completely enveloping Nick. Tony approaches, bringing the axe down as we cut to black. The final two in the family have been annihilated, though there is one more unaccounted for as of yet unborn life, Kate's child. Tony enters, placing the smaller TV down next to her body and taking a seat. A shock of light emits from his mouth as the cables leave his head, turning to Kate's stomach. A sea of black vines cover her body, searing her flesh as they pass. When pulling away, it has stripped her body down to the skeleton, but hearing a baby cooing, it puts some pleasant flashing lights on the screen, saying hello to Ruby, the name chosen by Scotty and Kate if they had a girl. Ruby stares deep into the screen, able to create a follower from a child, which is really what it seems to be after, telling Ruby to worship it. By having a newborn, it can be the only thing it ever knows, and thus they would never question it, blindly following whatever it says to do, because she doesn't know any anything else, and this would be the perfect follower. We leave the home, for the first time seeing outside since the invasion began. And if there was any doubt it was only contained to the Milgram family home, across the entire neighborhood each house is covered in the same black cable, so it most likely has already come from somewhere else and has been widespread through a larger radius, and appears to show no signs of slowing down. Humankind is screwed! That's pretty much what we get in the end. So what's the takeaway from all this? Well, a lot of it ties back to those concepts I mentioned back in the opening. In particular, the dangers of modern news media. It seems the writer is definitely not a fan. This idea is introduced early with the news report about the stabbing incident being a potential terrorist situation, and the family each jump to their own conclusion with no actual facts to back them up, along with Kate and her wild and unfounded prejudiced beliefs. This is all due to what they hear and believe to be fact that creates their mentality. Also in a broader sense, this relates to the family's story regarding how generations influence each other, and how more traditional beliefs carry on. It was due to Tony's horrible upbringing at Gramps' hands that probably did result in him not being successful beyond office manager, as he was constantly told he was incapable of being a man or leading his family. And then with his children, Kate was indoctrinated to her father's thoughts and chose not to question what was presented just like her father and grandfather. While Nick is the black sheep and outsider because he's different than the others, and does actually form his own thoughts and opinions rather than inherently following what the other family members believe. This becomes much more amped up once the entity takes over, which is a much more extreme stand-in of how the news shapes our truths and opinions. And just as with the real news broadcast before, the family, in particular Tony, follows the TV's orders without question, believing them to be benevolent, and never questioning the possibility that it has its own intentions. Just as we see every day in the news across the world, everyone has their own agenda, and it's up to us to determine who we can trust. The fact that the entity appears to be made up entirely of video cables, and that it chooses to communicate through televisions makes this connection more absolute. In a sense, what we are seeing is a metaphor for how inundated we are with information from every direction in modern day, effectively invading and taking over our lives. And we have to question everything before believing it at face value. Because if we don't, it can have grave consequences expressed via the video killer cable entity needing followers to blindly listen to its message. With that, we have reached the conclusion of this ending explained on a wait for other instructions. This was way denser and more metaphorical than I would have initially anticipated, and I did enjoy how it chose to relay its ideas and concepts through the use of a sci-fi invasion making it so that pretty much every aspect of the story and film itself is enhancing and adding to its broader themes. Pretty good job! Now before we go, don't forget you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Await Further Instructions and its ending? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix, see you next time. And worship me!